Okay. So those of you who are taking it for credit, you have taken QFT1, right? Okay, because this is really going to be sequel to QFT1. So what I'll do by is to begin by briefly recalling the results from QFT1 that we are going to use. Okay, not even the results, but the general idea of what we are going to use this course for. So. So, QFT1 essentially you can divide into two parts. Okay. One is the general formalism. Okay. And in that uh, context, you probably learned that uh, uh, one of the main uh, ingredients of quantum field theory is a Green's function. Okay. Green's functions are important okay. because given the Green's function okay, or uh, correlation function, you can extract uh, most of the information about the theory from there. Okay. So, for example, if we take a scalar field theory, okay. so we take a scalar field phi. Okay. Let's suppose we take a single scalar field. Okay. Then the Green's function is a time ordered product vacuum expectation of the time order product of operators <coughs> so let me explain this various rotation so this is our vacuum. This symbol is time ordered product, okay, which means that whatever be the order of operators inside this product, you always make sure that the earliest time, okay, the one with the earliest time in the argument is to the extreme right, the one with the largest time or the latest time is to the extreme left. Okay, that's how you define time ordered product. And this phi hat is a field operator. This is a field operator. Is this rotation familiar to everybody? Sir, uh, is there a e to the power minus means interest e to the power minus i interest e? Well, the one I am using Heisenberg picture, right? So these are all operators in the Heisenberg picture. So let me write what phi is. So phi hat f x t is, let me get the signs correct, it is e to the i h hat t phi hat of x e to the minus i h hat t. So I am using the Heisenberg picture where the vacuum on any state is time independent. And the operators are time dependent. Okay, so this is the Schrodinger picture operator. Okay, this is the Heisenberg picture operator. So I'll be using Heisenberg picture uh, uh, throughout. Okay, in that case, you don't have to write any explicit into the IHRT in this. Okay. Now, why is the Green's function useful? Okay, for example, you probably have seen. That if we know the two point Green's function, this contains information about the mass. It's familiar? Okay, you have to take a Fourier transform, write it as a function of p, okay. and then you look for poles as a function of p, okay. where if p, if p square equal to minus m square is the location of the pole, then m is the mass of the body. On the other hand, if you have an endpoint function g x1 to x n, this gives you information about the scattering amplitudes. Via L z 
reduction. This is familiar? Okay, so if I give you the Green's function, you can calculate the scattering amplitude. So this is a general formalism. The second aspect of quantum field theory that we have learned is how to actually compute these objects. Right? How do you calculate these two-point function and n-point function? Okay. And there we use mostly perturbation theory. Okay. So what we do is that we write the Hamiltonian H hat as a sum of two terms. One is a free Hamiltonian. Okay, this just represents free fields, which is easy to solve. Plus some small parameter, which I call lambda times H hat interaction. So this is the free Hamiltonian. This is the interaction term. And this lambda is some small parameter in which you do perturbation expansion. Okay, so you do perturbation expansion. Gives rise to what we call Feynman groups. Okay, you get get the result as a sum of Feynman diagrams. Okay, and the Feynman rules tell you how to associate with a Feynman diagram an actual expression. Is this okay? Now. One way that this course will differ from what we had done earlier okay, is that we will try to use a different procedure for calculating these Green's functions. Okay? We will see that for simple theories like uh, scalar field theory, they will eventually lead to the same Feynman rules. Okay? Nevertheless, the procedure will be different okay, and because it is more versatile in some sense. This will be the path integral approach. And as I said, we will see that it leads to the same Feynman rules. Nevertheless, there are several advantages of this approach. 
you are using path integral. The first advantage is that it gives a manifest Lorentz covariant formulation. In the earlier approach, okay, when you do this, for example, okay, defining a Hamiltonian okay, means that you are singling out time coordinate as patient, right? Because Hamiltonian gives a time equation, and Hamiltonian by itself is not Lorentz invariant, right? Because it, uh, 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 the uh, uh, momentum and energy are treated differently. Okay. Of course, the final Feynman rules that you derive for, say, phi to the fourth theory. We are Lorentz invariant, right? You can reformulate the result in a Lorentz invariant way, <coughs> but at the intermediate stage, you certainly lose Lorentz invariance because you give time coordinate a spatial treatment. Okay. In contrast, we will see that here, throughout, we can maintain Lorentz covariance. Okay. That's one advantage. The second advantage is that sometimes the canonical approach or the, the this Hamiltonian approach can become complicated particularly when the interaction terms are derivatives. So again, I'll try to give a, an example. So let's suppose that you have a Lagrangian of the form Normally, you write lambda phi to the four, okay? But this is as, yeah, as good an interaction term, right? There's a four uh, uh, quadratic order in phi. And now, suppose you want to treat this in the Hamiltonian formulation. Okay. So let's single out the time part. So this, my notation will be that the eta zero zero is minus one. Everything else is plus one. Okay. So eta mu nu in my notation, eta mu nu. This is a matrix minus one, 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 one. So this gives you <coughs> half phi dot square minus lambda phi square phi dot square plus space derivative terms, right? Okay, which, which you don't care about right now. Right? This gives you half phi dot square. Okay, and from here you get minus lambda phi square phi dot square. So from this, if we try to calculate the canonical momentum phi, you have to take the derivative of the Lagrangian functional derivative with respect to phi dot. Okay. So that gives you phi dot from the first term minus 2 lambda phi square phi dot from the second term. So this is phi dot times 1 minus 2 lambda phi square. Okay? So now, if you want to de derive the new Hamiltonian, well, if you want to derive the Hamiltonian in the presence of this interaction term, The 
Hamilton will be integral d cube x phi dot pi minus L phi dot pi minus L okay. and then you are supposed to really express this in terms of pi right not phi dot Hamiltonian is always expressed in terms of pi and phi right not phi dot and phi okay. so what will you do you will have to express phi dot in terms of pi right so this gives you phi dot as pi over 1 minus 2 lambda phi square right so this you can easily check gives you integral d cube x half pi square over 1 minus 2 lambda phi square plus <coughs> These are space derivative terms. Okay, which is just minus of what we have got up here in the lagrange. Okay. But you see that here we have something in the denominator. Okay, now of course in quantum field theory, if you have something in the denominator, it's a problematic situation. But in perturbation theory, what we will do is to re expand this out in a power series in lambda and derive the Feynman rules from there. Okay? But you see that now we have the problem that it contains arbitrary parts of infinite number of terms. And of course, to a given order in lambda, you only have a finite number of terms. But as you go to higher and higher parts in lambda, you get more and more interaction terms. Right? Because suppose you have to calculate up to lambda to the 10. Then you have to expand this out to order lambda to the 10 and keep all the interaction terms. Okay, so the Feynman rules will become complicated. Is this clear? Um, how is that different? I mean, once you expand it, you will have one term for one power, right? So you can just take that term. You can take that term, but when you draw Feynman diagrams, right? Suppose you have to calculate six point Feynman diagrams, right? So then you have to include a six point vortex. Yes. Okay, because this will have a six point vortex. You have to include the vortices like this, up to 6 point it may still be manageable, right? but you can already see that the number of terms will keep growing, number of Feynman diagrams will keep growing because you not only have 6 point vortex, you also have 4 point vortex, but I think this is 2 4 point vortex, that right? in loops you will get many more terms, right? so it is possible to do this but it just makes it uh, uh, more complicated because the number of diagrams increase. Right? If we just naively derive the final rules from that. Right? So it's certainly possible to do this, but it just becomes inconvenient. Okay? We'll see that in the path integral approach, you don't have such problems. Okay? You never get things in the denominator. If the Lagrangian, if the original Lagrangian didn't have things in the denominator, okay, you will not encounter things in the denominator in the path integral approach, in the final rules. <coughs> but the main reason that you want to do path integral approach is because the path integral approach is easier, much easier to implement for non abelian gauge theorems. And this will be one of the main uh, topic that will be studied. The non abelian gauge theory, because this is what is responsible for the strong and weak forces that we see in nature. Are there questions? So I'll give a brief review of path, path integral approach that we apply in quantum mechanics. But I've assumed that you would have seen it once in quantum mechanics course. 
คือเวลาจะดูดีไปดีกว่าเขาติดสันเกิดสปอร์ตเห็นติดเดือดเล่นตัวจะไม่ใช่Consider a simple quantum mechanical system for which the Hamiltonian is has this form. <coughs> okay, the hat basically means as operators. This is associated with the classical Hamiltonian. Classical Hamiltonian. Is e square over 2m plus v of q, and we can also consider a classical Lagrangian. And you are probably familiar with the action principle, right? If you have a classical Lagrangian like this, <coughs> then the action principle tells us that you get the equations of motion by extremizing the action. Equation of motion follow from okay, so the action by definition is integral of the Lagrangian, okay. and what one means by extremization is the following okay, that. Imagine that we are given some initial time t prime, some initial position q prime, and some final time t double prime, and some final position q double prime. Then you draw some path connecting. These two points, initial point and the final point, okay. and then you vary this path till the action is extremized, okay. which means that the classical path for classical path delta s is equal to zero to first order. Have a class. Suppose this is a classical path. Okay. Then to test it, to test if it's classical path, what you do is that you take a neighboring path, calculate the difference in this integral between the neighboring path and the classical path. <coughs> that difference will always be zero to first order. Okay. That only then you can say that this is a classical path. Okay. This satisfies classical equations of motion. If this difference is not zero to first order, then this path is not classical. That does the action principle. This is familiar. Okay, but of course you want to do quantum mechanics, so let's go back to quantum mechanics. Okay, this is the Hamiltonian, and define certain things, and then see how to calculate them.
So again, let's go to Heisenberg picture. Okay, so we define q hat of t as e to the power i h hat t. Oh, I should have said I'll set the Planck's constant h bar equal to one throughout this analysis so that we don't have to write this bar. So this is the Heisenberg picture representation of the position of part of Q hat. And similarly you can define P hat of T. Okay, but I'll not write down the explicit. We also define Q by definition okay, is the eigenstate of Q hat operator. Okay, so this I'll call Q hat. Okay, so if I have not written any uh, uh, argument, okay, that's the q hat of t equal to 0. So I define this q as the eigen set of the q hat operator with the eigen value q. And similarly, I define, let's call this p prime. These are the prime will mean that these are eigen sets of the momentum operator. You can consider this inner product Q with P prime. Okay, first of all, Q with Q prime, of course, will be delta function, right? That P with P prime will be delta function. So P prime with P prime will be delta function. So what about okay, this object? You know what it what its expression is? E to the power i q p, right? E to the power i q p. Okay, up to normalization, which you will not worry about right now. And P prime Q will be to the power minus I Q. Well, this is a conjugate of this one. So we'll also define a state which I'll call QT. This by definition will be e to the power i h hat P So what the property that it has is that if you apply q hat of t on q t, okay, if you use this expression, you see that the e to the minus i h hat t cancels that e to the i h hat t, and so this gives you e to the i h hat t q hat on q, but this of course is just q times q, so this is q on Q. Okay. So this state, which I have denoted by QT, is an eigenset of Q hat T with eigenvalue Q. Okay, that's what I have to define by this state. Okay. Another definition, K Q prime P prime. <coughs> Q double prime T double prime will define to be the state Q double prime T double prime Q prime T prime. Okay, we'll take 
T double prime be larger than T prime. So this I can write as Q double prime. Because if the state was the same, right, then if you start with a state that is an eigenvalue of eigenstate of q hat of 0, right, it will not remain the eigenstate of q hat of t. Because q hat is changing, right? q hat, yes. q hat is a time dependent operator, right. So if you take a fixed state, right, which was an eigenstate to begin with, it will not remain an eigenstate. Except for Hamiltonian, right. For Hamiltonian, of course, if you start with the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, it always remains an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. But Q operator doesn't come out with Hamiltonian, right? So if you start with the eigenstate of certain eigenvalue, right, after some time, <coughs> it will not remain an eigenstate, right? So on the other hand, by definition, this QT right, is a new state which is an eigenstate of Q hat. Right? That's this is the, our definition of QT. Okay. If you don't like this definition, you can just use this as definition, right? We don't really need this definition very much, right? All you need is this aspect of this state. Is this okay? Are there other questions? So what we'll do now is to, so okay. So of course, if you know the Hamiltonian, we can in principle calculate. But what we will do now is to give an expression for this that is based on the path integral approach. Okay, we will of course start with this and we will manipulate this to write it in a form okay, which looks like integration over paths and then we will generalize this to more complicated objects. Eventually, we will take the limit when n becomes n goes to infinity. And let's write that expression delta is just t double from minus t prime, so this is an identity. But now, I will write this as a product of n factors of this kind. And now I insert a complete set of states here, okay, which will take to the position eigenbasis. 
So, integral, let me call this variable dq n minus 1. This is the identity. This is the identity of my, my completeness of states. Right? This is a complete set of states. So I just integrate over the whole position for us. This is an identity operator. Qn minus 1 is just the name of this variable. Okay. Then here I insert integral dq n minus 2. and so on. So, similar finally here, so here I do not have to insert anything, here I insert integral dq1 So, this gives you altogether n minus 1 insertions, right, which separates out these n factors. <coughs> okay, but you are just inserting identity in each of them. In this uh, e to the power minus i delta, yes. We explicitly assume that there is no time explicit time dependent. That's right. Yeah, we are assuming that h hat is time independent. Mm. Right? If h hat is time dependent, then you have to instead of using e to the minus i h hat t, right? You have to use time ordered expression. Okay, and then you have to uh, 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 do appropriate time ordering here. Okay, but let's just assume that h hat is time independent. Are there other questions? Okay, if h hat is not time independent, then you, I mean, you couldn't have even written the first expression e to the minus i h hat t double prime minus t prime because that would have been an integ time order, integral in the exponent, but that has to be time ordered. Okay. Yeah, but then in case this the second one is still true. Right? Second one would still be true, yes. Okay, except that the each of these will be different. Age. Exactly. Delta will be still, but these different H hat will be different. Okay, so what you can think of what this is doing is that it is taking the state Q prime okay, and instead of evolving it in one stage from T from T prime to T double prime, okay, that this one is evolving it to from T prime to T prime plus delta. Okay. Next one is evolving it from T prime plus delta to T prime plus 2 delta and so on. And if h is time dependent, okay, then this h hat and the next h hat will be slightly different. Okay, so this this expression is still true, right? But you couldn't have written the original expression. That's equal to the minus i h hat times t double prime minus t prime. Is this okay? Right? See, writing it this way makes it clear that you are doing an infinitesimal evolution, right? So here you can just take h hat to be its uh, time independent, right? Its central value. Okay, but then different h hat will be different. So this product then I can write <coughs> as, so this I will write as product say i equal to 0 to n minus 1 okay. So with the understanding that Qn is by definition Q double prime and Q0 by definition is Q prime. <coughs> okay, then this is like Qn e to the minus i delta h hat Qn minus 1. Okay, that's the i equal to n minus 1 term here. Qn e to the minus i delta h hat Q n minus 1 then the i equal to n minus 2 term and so on. 
Is this clear? Right? Yes. इंटीग्रल एच ऑफ टी डीटी ओके दैट वुड हैव बीन द रॉन्ग एक्सप्रेशन ओके फॉर्मली यू कैन स्टिल राइट इट इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड टेक इट एज अंडरस्टूड दैट इट्स ऑलवेज टाइम ऑर्डर्ड ओके द अर्लियर स्टेजेस एक्ट फर्स्ट राइट देन द लेटर एचेस एंड सो ऑन ओके दैट्स इक्विवेलेंट टू दिस ओके बट एज आई सेड जस्ट टू अवॉइड कॉम्प्लिकेशन आई एम टेकिंग एच हैड टू बी टाइम इंडिपेंडेंट Okay, so we now want to evaluate this. <coughs> so, then our goal is to evaluate q i plus one to the minus i delta. Now let me write down the expression for h hat. H hat is v of q hat plus p hat square over q hat. So integral I'll be performing later. Oh, here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Integral d q two, d q one to d q n minus one. Yes. Okay. So you have to evaluate this. So what we'll do is to write this. So what have we done? See, so this is like e to the a times e to the b. E to the a times e to the b. Okay, you can combine using the Becker-Tempel-Hausdorff formula. Okay, this is e to the power a plus b. But there are corrections, right? That it starts from half a commutator b plus other terms. Now here, because these don't commute. Okay, q hat and p hat don't come. Okay. So clearly there will be corrections. Okay, this times this is not just this. Okay. The important point, however, is that the corrections are bilinear in A B, okay, or higher order. Okay. Since both of these operators A and B have delta multiplying them, okay. whatever correction term you have here, okay. that's a order delta square. Is this clear? And that's what I have written here. Okay, there are some corrections which is of order delta square e to the i delta square. Okay. So if we ignore this, we will make an error. Okay, we will make an error whose percentage error is of order delta square. Okay, so <coughs> when you expand it out, it's like one plus delta square times something. Okay, so the percentage error is of order, of order delta square. And now you recall that you have to multiply n such factors. Okay. So even if the error is one is small, error in one is small, when you multiply by n factors, the error can become large. Okay. And indeed, if the percentage error was a whole one over delta, okay. then when you multiply n of these, 
you could get a total accumulation of order 1. Right? So 1 plus delta times 1 plus delta multiplied n times right? can become of order 1. Is that clear? Yeah, because it's like 1 plus n delta, right? n delta becomes of order 1. But if we have error of order delta square, right? if it's like 1 plus delta square, you multiply n times, okay? you'll get 1 plus delta square times n. Now, delta times n is fixed. Okay? So, delta square times n is still delta times t double prime minus t prime. Is this clear? Okay. So, if we take the large n limit, okay, then the error that we are making here will not affect the result at the end. Right? Because in each step, in each of these terms, you are making an error, which is percentage error is of order delta square. Okay. You multiply error of these factors, the percentage error still remains small. <coughs> right? Because it becomes of order n delta square, right? which is still small. So, for this reason, I can now ignore this term. Okay. But remember that this, ignoring this term is valid only in the large n limit. Okay. For any finite n, you are making an error. Okay. But keeping in mind that at the end, we will take n to infinity. Okay. We do not worry about this error. Okay. We just drop this term. Okay. And so, we have this nice expression for here. Okay. Product of two terms. You could have also extend them. Right? You could have brought this first and this next, it will get uh, still the error is of order delta square. So now, this is an eigenset of q hat. Okay. This is a function of q hat. Right. So what will happen when this acts on this? Okay. This is of course a Hardy-Sheer operator. Right. So q hat acting on the left and right gives the same thing. So you know the result for this. So what will happen? We just replace q hat operator by q i plus 1. Right? Any function of q hat acting on the eigenstate q will give you f of q times the same eigenstate. So, this then gives e to the power minus i delta v of q i plus 1. <coughs> Now we will insert a complete set of states here. At this time it will be the momentum eigen state. <coughs> <Okay. coughs> so this gives you to be minus i delta of q by plus 1 <coughs> integral dp. Now, p hat e to the minus i delta p hat square is acting on a momentum eigenstate. Right? So, you can replace p hat by p. Right? Same argument. So, e to the power minus i delta p square by p hat. And then you have q i plus 1 p prime sorry, p and then p prime q i.
this one is e to the power i p q i plus 1 and this one is e to the power minus i p q i. <coughs> right, so this becomes e to the power minus i delta z of q i integral <coughs> dt. So you have to now do this integral. This is a Gaussian integral. Okay, so we will just complete the square. Okay, so what I did was that I, this is a quadratic term and a linear term. Okay, I completed the square over here. Okay, I delta p square by 2m, that is the first term. Then it will be minus i delta, well, yeah. minus i delta times delta by 2m times the cross term. Okay, cross term exactly cancels this and gives you back the p times i p times q i plus 1 minus q i. But then there is an extra term which is the square of this, okay, which I have to subtract out, and that's this term over here. Now this integral, okay, so now you see that this is independent of e. Okay. This integral, I can shift origin, okay, call this p time, okay, so this becomes something that is independent of q's, okay, just some constant. So I write this as a times e to the power minus i v i delta d q i plus 1 plus i m over 2 delta q i plus 1 minus q i square. Is this clear? So now let us go back to our original expression, k q prime t prime q double prime t double prime will be product i equal to 0 k n minus 1 of this object. Right? This is what the individual term in the product is what I so a times e to the power minus i delta v of q i plus 1 plus i m over 2 delta q i plus 1 minus q i square. So this becomes a to the power n okay, which will be not too relevant for 
us and then exponential let me write this so I'll write as a sum minus i delta well, there are too many i's but this i is square root of minus 1 ok not the it will be distinguished for the index i So let's see what you have done. The first one is straightforward, right? I have just written exponential minus i delta times the sum over this because the product right, that becomes sum from i equal to 0 to n minus 1. In the second term, okay, i m over 2, what I have done is that I have taken a delta outside okay, so, this, so that this becomes delta square and I wrote that delta in the denominator over here. Integrals over integrals. Yes, integrals over q's, thank you. dq1 to dqn minus 1. So this is integral dq1 to dqn minus 1. Okay, a to the n of course I can bring outside, this is just a constant. Now, what I claim is that this can be written, okay, this can be thought of as integral dq1 to dq n minus 1 of e to the power i s, okay, where s is the action, s is integral l dt, which is integral half <coughs> nq dot square plus of q dt. Okay, so I'll now explain how this integral here is related to what we have here. Sorry, there's a minus, right? Lagrangian is the minus right here. <coughs> okay. So let's see how in what sense this is that one. So suppose this is a path. Okay. This is this is my t type. This is t double type. Now let's divide this whole interval into size delta. So this is t prime plus delta. This is t prime plus 2 delta and so on. <coughs> Here it will be t prime plus n minus 1 <coughs> delta. Okay, and finally when we apply L de n delta it becomes t double prime. Because t double prime minus t prime is <coughs> So this is Q prime. So let's call this Q1. I'm just renaming it. Okay. Call this Q1. 
<coughs> this as q2 and so on okay take a path arbitrary path so forget about this expression over here altogether okay i'll try to make connection with this one later okay but right now let's see what <coughs> how we can represent the action so take an arbitrary path like this okay. <coughs> divide this time interval into intervals of size delta okay. and for every delta whatever the value of q you have for that path you call this q1 q2 etc okay in that case integral v of q dt to minus sign minus integral v of q dt okay. using the definition of integral i can write this as <coughs> minus delta This is the definition of an integral, right? As a limit of a sum. Okay. I take the sum of these intervals and I multiply by delta. Okay, just to compensate. I mean, otherwise you write it as t prime t double prime minus t prime over delta okay. times this sum. Is this point clear? Clear. <coughs> See, v was one. Let's just check. Okay, Normalize this. If v was one, then this will give you n times delta. Right? Which is t double prime minus t prime. If v is 1, this side will give you t double prime minus t prime. That is still n prime delta. Okay, so that fixes the normalization. Now, t double prime minus t double prime, half m q dot square dt. Okay, so now let's try to calculate this. Okay. So this is, again, write it as a sum. So delta the first half m times delta sum i equal to zero to n minus one u dot at t prime plus i delta square. I have to calculate q dot. Okay, what is q dot? q dot is the slope. Okay, for this part, q dot is calculated by calculating the slope. slope. Okay, but you have to calculate the slope in this ith term, p time plus i time. <coughs> okay, that's the particular time interval for time at which you have, to, you have to calculate the slope. This is our t. Right? t, the running variable, is t time plus i delta. As you are summing over i, you are integrating over t. But this one, I can write as q i plus 1 minus q i over delta. Okay, delta is the interval. Okay, so you calculate the i plus 1 at value minus i at value divided by delta. Okay, so that is this one. <coughs> so now you are more or less done. Just have to put things together. So e to the i s, e to the i s is e to the i. First you have this in this one, so it is minus i delta minus i delta <coughs> plus i by 2 
And this is exactly what we have here. Yeah, so then in this sense, you can think of this as exponential of i times s. Is this clear? So formally one writes this as k q p q prime p prime q double prime d double prime as integral d q to the i s. Well, there's a normalization. Let me put. Let me put some arbitrary normalization. Okay, it will not really matter at the end. So this is some normalization. So what does this symbol mean? Okay, this formally is the sum of our paths, okay, or integral of our paths. Okay. But in practice, what it means is the following: that when you have an expression like this, okay, this is sum of our paths. So this, I should write that. Of course, when you write dq, okay, I should tell you which paths you should integrate over. Okay. The path should start at q prime t prime and end at q double prime t double. Prime. Okay. So, you fix the endpoints okay, and integrate over all paths. Okay, that's what this is formally saying. Okay. And for any given path, the weight factor is into the IS. Okay. But in practice, okay, when you actually try to implement it, what you will do? Of course, you cannot sum integrate over continuous paths. Right? You'll break the path into many segments. Right? Just like what you have done here, a path is a collection of q values at regular intervals. You break the path into many segments, then you represent the action, okay, which was an integral to begin with, okay, as a sum, okay, which is a function of the q values at those segments. Right? Once you discretize the action, right, it depends only on the q values at these points, right? as you can see here. Right? This depends only on the q values at those particular intervals. And then what you say, when you say we integrate over path, right? what you mean precisely is that you integrate over each of those qi's. Right? Because that is like integrating over path, right? As you vary a path, okay, what will happen? Each of these qi's will change. Okay? So the definition of what you mean by integrating over path okay, is simply that you break up the path into segments and then you integrate over the q values for each of those segments, okay, for each point. So it becomes a regular discrete int integral over a discrete set of variables okay, as opposed to a continuous set of variables. Okay, because you don't know a priori what you mean by integrating over a continuous set of variables. Okay, so you break it up into discrete set and you integrate over each of them. Is this point clear? Okay. So when I write something like this, okay, this is what? will mean right? that you discretize and then you integrate over each of those variables, discrete set of variables. Okay, are there questions? This is yeah, explain that. Yeah, so this basically <laughs> means okay, this. It basically means, well, I have it, it basically means this. Right? The integrate over q1, q2 up to qn minus 1. Okay, so you take a given path, okay, you take q prime, t prime, the initial point, final point, those are fixed. Okay. Now, Consider, divide the integral okay, into several integ intervals, right, n intervals, and then you say that at, for t prime plus i delta, okay, at this time, q takes some value, let's call this qi, okay, <coughs> of course, if you have fixed a path, you know what qi is, right, but you have not fixed a path, you are supposed to integrate over paths, right, okay. so then qi's are not determined. 
it's these QIs that you integrate over. Okay. So specify a path in this case will mean specifying the QIs. Okay. Once you have specified the QIs, okay, then you can evaluate the action by this, this formula, okay, this realization formula. That is your weight factor. Okay. And then integrating over paths in this language means integrating, integrating over each of the QIs. Then you can say that as you are integrating over the QIs, okay, the path is changing. Right? Different configuration of QIs correspond to different paths. Right? So what do we mean by integrating over paths is integrating over the QIs. Is this point clear? Okay, so this DQ is by definition this. This. And sir, every, uh, every Q will be varied from minus in, uh, infinity to infinity? Yes, every Q will be varied from minus infinity to infinity. Which means you are actually summing over paths which fluctuate widely. Right? I mean, this one, for example, can be here, this one can be there. Okay? Of course, it may happen that the integral receives contribution only from smooth paths. Right? That may happen. It may not happen. It depends on the details of the fall of the action. But, sir, uh, yes. if we take, uh, means uh, within time delta, if I take one point here and one point here, yes. so within this time delta, we are considering, suppose, the paths which are actually not causally related. That can happen, right? That can happen, yes. And you so, are supposed to integrate over all of those. So, uh, so this all over path integration is not means. So, uh, that that also we are taking that causally those two points are not related. Within this small time, the information cannot get. Yes. Yeah, so you are not imposing, for example, that this q i plus one minus q i over delta, which is the velocity, yeah. is less than c. Yeah. That okay. not imposing. Yes, that's true. You are not but, imposing that, but, but are they? Eventually, you have to make sure that your final theory is causal. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't allow things to propagate faster than light. Yeah. Yeah, but at least at the level of the path integral, you don't put any restriction that you only uh, uh, sum over causal points. Right? It could happen that the particular time t is at one point and the particular time t plus 1 okay, at a completely different point, which is which would be possible if the particle had moved at a velocity a lot faster than c. So at least at the level of the path integrals, you don't impose any constraint that the paths have to be causal. Is this point clear? Any other questions? Sir, how can we fix the normalization constant? Well, yeah, as you will see, the normalization constant will not be needed, right? Because the, finally, the quantity that we will be interested in is this Green's function, right? which is a ratio of two quantities. Yeah, you had the time order product in the numerator and also the normalization of the vacuum in the denominator. And when you calculate the ratio, this normalization constant will disappear. Yeah, that's why you don't really have to worry about the normalization constant. Any other question? At any finite n, we still have that 1 over n correction that we Yes. So at any finite n, of course, you will always make an error. Right? And the hope is that the error will go to 0 in the limit when n goes yes. to infinity. And that integral will also not uh, do anything to it. Yes, it, you have to make sure that the integral doesn't yeah. do anything to it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, <coughs> you don't know a priori that this will give a finite result as n goes to infinity. Right? It's a formal <laughs> object that we have uh, defined. Right? In, for, for quantum mechanics, at least one can show explicitly that this does give finite result okay, for physical quantities. Okay, now let's consider a somewhat more general quantity.
So, so we can fix the normalization by saying that <coughs> k q prime t prime to that quantity yes. gives that physical in meaning that uh, the form particle starts from t prime at, at time t prime and goes to q double prime at time t t, t double, double prime. Yes. So if we can integrate over q do q double prime, then it will be, it will give, give one because uh, total uh, probability amplitude. Yes, you can fix it that way also. Yes. Okay, okay but in quantum field theory, as you see, there will be things are much more complicated so I mean uh, this this works in quantum mechanics but in quantum field theory it's hard to fix the normalizing constant that way right? but we will not really need to fix it fix the normalizing constant okay so here we have a time ordered product and we will assume that t double prime is larger than t1 t2 up to Tn and this is larger than T prime. Okay. But these themselves can have arbitrary ordering. Okay. Time ordering means that you always have to make sure that the earliest one comes to the right okay, the latest one comes to the left. Okay. <laughs> but T prime is always earlier than everything else okay. and this is later than everything else. Okay. So let's suppose that the correct ordering, correct ordering is t tilde n greater than t tilde n minus one. T tilde one, where this set t tilde one to t tilde n. This is a rearrangement. Of T one to T n. Okay, T one to T n may not have any ordering, but we just re-level these uh, variables by T tilde one to T tilde n, so that they have the correct ordering. So then this is given by q double prime q double prime. Now I, I don't I will not write time ordering anymore. Q hat t tilde n q hat t tilde n minus one. I can write down in the Hamiltonian formulation. I just rewrote everything in the uh, in terms of the uh, this q hat part. Q hat t equal to zero. So this is similar to what we had done earlier, except that some q hats are sprinkled throughout. Okay? Otherwise, it's the same integral that we, the same expression that we had earlier. 
And our goal will be to figure out what the effect of this q hats are. Right? We want to write a path integral expression for this, taking into account the effect of this q hats. Is this OK? So let's suppose that t tilde 1, let's call this t tilde i minus t prime as ki delta. <laughs> okay, so ki is by definition t tilde i minus t prime divided by delta. <laughs> With some, uh, I assume that k, k i are all integers. You can see by taking delta to be sufficiently small, you can always make sure that t tilde i minus t time is an integral multiple of delta. Okay, and let's assume that uh, we have done that. So all the k i's are integers. So now let's see what is going to happen. So we proceed as before. So this one is e to the minus i h hat times delta e to the minus i h hat delta <coughs> this will be k1 times. <coughs> right? Because t tilde 1 minus t prime is k1 times delta. Okay? So that will be k1 times this operation. This was, of course, they are even earlier. Okay? They are in altogether factors into the minus i h at delta, so k1 was certainly there. And we proceed as before by applying here we insert q1 q1 then you insert q2 q2 integrate over this and then finally here you will insert q q k1 qk1 So you see one factor is followed by q1, two factors is followed by q2, so k factors will be followed by qk, k1 factors will be followed by qk1. Is correct? What is the relation between i and ki? i and ki, okay, t tilde i, this i is the, uh, uh, i takes value 1 to n, right? Those are the places where you have inserted. So ki is t tilde i minus t prime by delta. That's the definition of ki. So k1 is t1 tilde minus t prime by delta. k2 will be t2 tilde minus t prime by delta and so on. That's the definition of the ki's. Is that clear? Right? Yeah. Right? So q hat t, I mean you can see that why is this important? Then? It's important because between the first q hat and this q1, q prime, there are e to the minus i h hat t1 tilde minus t prime factor, right? This is k1 factor sub e to the minus i h at delta from this definition. Right? t1 tilde minus t prime is k1 delta. Right? So e to the minus i h at delta applied k1 times will give you e to the minus i h at times t1 tilde minus t prime. Right? That's the significance of this factor. So k1 factors have come. But then something new happens. We have a q hat inserted. <coughs> yeah? Okay? Then it's the usual stuff. E to the minus i h hat delta. Now there will be k2 minus k1 times. This will come. Here, you will get q k2, q k2, 
and then another factor of q hat in circuit. Is this clear? You see here, between these, there are q all factors of equal to the minus i h hat delta, right? Then a q hat in circuit gets inside. Mm -hmm. Then to the minus i h hat delta k2 minus q1 factors. Right? Then again another insert of q hat. Yeah. And so on. Okay? But now you see that because q hat acts on a q eigen state, right? this just gives a factor of q k1. Right? Here q hat acts on q eigen state, this gives a factor of q k2. And so on. Is this clear? Then what's the result of path integral? Okay, then you can you just carry, carry out the analysis exactly as before. So this then can be written as integral dq. Okay, let me write dq to to dq n minus 1 e to the is okay, this is to be discretized and then there is a factor of q k n q k n minus 1 up to q k 1 so the, those integral will now be d q k 2 q k n no the integrals are over all q's which includes in, in particular d q k 2 d q k r and so on right but these integrals also you have to do, right? The q1, q2, these integrals also you have to do, right? The only additional thing are these factors. Yeah. The dq1 dq, yes, dq1, thank you. It starts from dq1 to dq n minus 1. Is this clear? But what is QK1? Right? If you go look, look at the this picture again. <coughs> what is QK? Right? QK means that you have gone k delta from t prime okay. and the value of q that we get here is q k right but t prime plus k delta t prime plus k delta is our tt is again right so this then i can write as q of t tilde n Q of t tilde n minus 1 up to Q of t tilde 1. Okay, that's the interpretation in terms of the paths. Okay? As variables of integration, Q1, Q2 up to Qn minus 1, you had the Q, K1, Q, K2 up to Qn. But when you think of what it means in terms of paths, right? or a given path, Qk is just what you get the value of Q at T plus uh, T prime plus K delta. Is this point clear? But now you say this is an ordinary integral, right? These are not operators. It's just an ordinary integral you are doing. Okay? So how you order this has no relevance. Right? You can order them in any way. It's just or, uh, uh, integral is an integral, right? <laughs> we also know that the set t1 tilde, t2 tilde up to tn tilde is the same as the set t1, t2 up to tn, just rearranged. Okay. So I can write this as integral dq e to the is q of t1 to q of tn. Is this clear? Now, if we think of this in reverse, okay, 
what it is saying is that if we calculate anything like this, doesn't matter how the TIs are ordered, what it calculates is a matrix element of the time ordered product. Okay. So path integral <laughs> automatically computes the matrix element of path integral uh, of time ordered product. Okay. You don't have to say anything about time ordering here. Okay. In fact, if you didn't have time ordering, if you want to calculate matrix element of something which is not time ordered, okay. then there is no direct path integral expression for this. Well, you can ri write it down, but it's much more complicated. Okay. The standard path integral expression that we'll write okay, always gives the matrix element of time ordered product. Is this part clear? Okay, so our next task okay, will be to extract from here what you want, namely the vacuum expectation value of this. Okay, that's what you really want, right? We don't want to calculate between Q prime T prime and Q double prime T double prime. We want to calculate the vacuum expectation value. Okay. In general, the vacuum is not known in terms of Q. Right? The vacuum may be the wave, wave function of the vacuum, may be a configured object, right? We don't know what it is. Okay. But nevertheless, we will see that without knowing what the vacuum wave function is, okay, it is possible to extract from this the vacuum expectation value. <coughs> okay, so maybe I'll do that uh, next time. Okay, and then we'll generalize it to quantum field theories. Okay, once we learn how to do extract vacuum expectation value of time order products from path integral. Yes. So can you please emphasize how with the same data we will be able to get the integer number of integer ones? Well, the point is you know, eventually we will take delta going to zero. Right? So you can always choose t's to be integral multiple of delta. Right? Because the error that we will be making is a water delta. Right? See, as long as the function that we are looking for is a continuous function of the t, ti's, right? If you just adjust them a little to make sure that it's an integral multiple of delta. Right? You are allowed to do that. Okay? So that we will assume that you have always chosen your t's to be integral multiples of delta. Right? And as I said, as you take delta to be smaller and smaller, okay, you can always do this is with an uh, arbitrary small error. Essentially, the lattice becomes fine, right? As you take delta to uh, zero. Right? The interval, I mean, you are breaking up the interval into Lattice points, right? But the lattice size delta is going to zero. That means lattice is becoming finer and finer. Right? So, given any arbitrary point on that uh, real t axis, okay, there is always a lattice point arbitrarily close to it. That right? in the delta goes to zero limit. So, you just pick that lattice point. Is that yeah? Yes. How did you go from this one to this one? Oh, I just wrote each qt, I use the fact that q hat t is e to the i h hat p q hat e to the minus i h hat t. Okay, once you use this and and, and the, this one, <coughs> there are two things which are used. One is this one. The other one is that this state q prime t prime is it to the i h hat c prime times q prime and q double prime q double prime is q double prime e to the minus i h hat q double prime. Okay, so once you substitute this here, right, you get to this, right? Because this gives you, for example, e to the minus i h hat t double prime. Right? This has e to the i h hat t till then to the right, to the left. Right? Those combine to give you e to the minus i h at t double prime minus t nine. So it's exactly the same kind of analysis that we're doing earlier. Is this point clear? Maybe I should have done this a little carefully. So we, we are simply representing each of these, these are Heisenberg picture operators, right? by the fact that you can rewrite this as e to the i h at t q hat e to the minus i h at t. Okay, that's what we brought you from here to there. Is this clear or not so clear? Right, okay, maybe I can do
we start from here. Okay. So you get Q double prime e to the minus i h hat t double prime, right? That's the Q prime t double prime t double prime. Then Q hat t tilde n gives you e to the i h hat t tilde n Q hat e to the minus i h hat t tilde n. Next one, you have t tilde n minus 1 e to the i h hat t tilde n minus 1 q hat e to the minus i h hat t tilde n minus 1. Right? So now you see that these two combine e to the minus i h hat t double prime minus t tilde n. These two combine e to the minus i h hat t tilde n minus t tilde n minus 1 and so on. Okay? So, you may say similar, that is what we have here. We are involving both state and the operators? No, we are using Heisenberg picture. right? So, we are not evolving the states. Okay? States are being evolved just because it is the definition of Qt are given. Right? The definition of Q prime T prime. Right? Do not think of this as the storing the evolved state. Q prime T prime is just the state which is an eigenstate of Q hat of T. <coughs> right? And that is what determine the form of Q prime T prime <coughs> as this. E to the I H hat T prime times Q prime. <coughs> right? So this is not the evolution in the Schrodinger sense. Right? This in fact does not satisfy Schrodinger equation. Right? That would have been minus I H hat T prime. Okay? This is by definition the state which is eigenstate of q hat of t prime. That which you can easily verify, right? This is an eigenstate of q hat of t prime. Okay, because this e to the minus i h hat t prime will cancel this e to the i h hat t prime. So the whole thing is being carried out in the, as far as the, uh, the quantum side is concerned, right? Everything is being done in the Heisenberg picture. Okay. But of course the path integral does not care about any <coughs> operators, right? Path integral is just a classical integral. Operator, position operator which is evolving in time. So if we take its expectation value in this state, yes. which are evolving in time, yes. we will get the same value. Exactly. That is the definition of this state. Okay, in fact, you do not even have to take the expectation value, just calculate the eigenvalue. Right? This is supposed to be an eigenvalue, eigenstate of the position operator at time t prime. Okay, which is different from the evolution of the state using the Schrodinger picture. You mentioned something about uh, path integral expression for for out of time order coordinators. Could you elaborate on that? Well, no, I will not elaborate on that at this point. <laughs> <laughs> not now. I mean, it is a much more complicated <laughs> expression. Right? You have to use complex integration contours and so on. So, the standard path integral will generate time order expression. Any other questions? Okay, so soon then tomorrow we meet at two.